So this slideshow or presentation is on American industrialization. Uh, this is the first course, or I should say the first class, of the course for modern American history. And so we're entering in a period referred to as the Gilded Age. And uh, it's a time period after the Civil War and Reconstruction, going up until approximately 1900. And this is uh, a, a, an area of American history that does not always get covered because a lot of people have felt over the years that it was uh, somewhat of an unnecessary period. And yet, uh, this is really when America becomes a modern nation or sets the stage for its modernity. And it's a time period where America really emerges as a world power, or at the very least, a country that demands world attention. And so when we talk about the Gilded Age, uh, we talk about an era that is... Um, seen as somewhat freewheeling and not always necessarily uh, a positive one. And so uh, uh, the time period got its name from Mark Twain, who uh, was really coming of age in this time period. And he referred to it as the Gilded Age because he believed that it was very much like a gilded frame or other gilded products. On the outside, it was very shiny and gold and beautiful and desirable. But if you just flake away that uh, thin layer of uh, gold, you find, a, you find an item that is ordinary, corruptible, and uh, cheap. And so uh, Twain really saw this period as a somewhat gaudy and um, frivolous time period that was covering over a, a number of ills in America. And that's really a very good way to look at the time period. And industrialization is certainly no different in terms of uh, what goes on. America amazingly goes from essentially a non-industrial power uh, at the end of the Civil War. And by 1900, it's essentially the number one economic power on the planet. It's a, it's a rather uh, rapid and significant change for a lot of Americans and caused a great deal of, of stress and unrest for a lot of people. So when we talk about industrialization, I always uh, tell my students that it's it's good to remember that, there, that when we talk about industry, the eyes have it, right? The eyes of industry. And so today's lecture, if you will, is really about the eyes of industry. So we're going to be talking about inventions and these are essentially products that are made and produced and, and created in America at a time period when um, you know life was really very simple, and it, these products and and changed dramatically how Americans live their lives. Similar to that is innovation. Um, the number of uh, patents going out for products was really only matched by the number of new ways of doing things, different processes that get created. And we'll talk about some of those today. The infrastructure is also making very big changes. A rapid industrialization requires good infrastructure, whether we're talking about roads and canals and railroads or just a communication network in order to make information move more quickly. All those things had to happen in the Gilded Age. And then when we talk about integration, this is really a phenomenon that's happening in the corporate world. And this uh, really gets its foothold during the Gilded Age. And the idea of, in, uh, of integration is, is really about creating large entities that can take advantage of economies of scale. And then we need to talk about immigration. There's always been immigration in America. We go all the way back to the last ice age when um, Asiatic tribes uh, followed herds over the Bering Straits into what we now call North America. Uh, we've, we're all immigrants in some way, but it's during the Gilded Age, during the last, say, 30 years, 35 years of the 19th century, that over 15 million new Americans are going to arrive, and they're going to provide the cheap labor and the new ideas and innovations that make America the industrial power that it, that it would become. So let's start with inventions. 
So what a lot of people don't realize when we talk about invention is that the, before you can have any kind of improvement in industrial work, you first have to have cheaper, more efficient agricultural production. And so uh, when McCormick's Reaper uh, gets invented, uh, it dramatically reduces the amount of labor, time, and energy required to produce America's food. The Reaper, if you kind of can do a visual, was like taking an old-fashioned lawnmower and just making it really large and having it drawn by horses. Instead of one Reaper, meaning an individual with what's called a scythe, with uh, basically harvesting one handful of of wheat, a sheave, if you will, uh, with every stroke. Now a team of horses could drag McCormick's Reaper through a field and reap literally acres of wheat per day. And this is a dramatic change in how we feed ourselves in America. McCormick is going to follow up the Reaper with something called a mechanical thresher. And this was an item that followed behind the Reaper and actually helped to separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were, the fruit from the stalk. And this is even more important for the production of American grains. So combines, harvesters, and of course, refrigerated rail cars. For um, those of you who uh, live in the West Coast, this is really a very major innovation or invention. Uh, the refrigerated car is the reason why the Central Valley of California, for instance, becomes such a major food production area in the country. And for all of the fruits and vegetables and, and other perishable items that helped make places like California so unbelievably wealthy, the refrigerated car was essential because it doesn't matter how much produce you can, you can grow. If you can't get it to people who want to buy it and eat it, um, it's really n not worth anything at all. So business machines that get um, created at the time period really are pretty significant. The typewriter and telephone and telegraph are really the three big ones. Um, the typewriter and telephone are, and telegraph are all really about the speed with which we communicate with each other. And... When this happens, it revolutionizes business in the United States. So the typewriter and telephone is pretty obvious for most of us who either type on a computer or, or use a cell phone. But before any of that happened, the telegraph, right, really just moved America forward in so many ways. And so... Um, uh, Samuel S. B. Morris really did uh, the world just an incredible uh, favor by doing his invention, and the speed with which information could move from coast to coast, and then of course around the globe, really changed everything. And so, um, uh, communication really was the key. But electric motors, uh, the sewing machine, and elevator braking. So um, Elijah Otis, people always talk about you know whether he invented the elevator, and the fact of the matter is he didn't. The Romans did. The, the Romans, uh, back in ancient history, created what we would today call an elevator, but it was a box tied to a rope and a pulley, uh, and then uh, you know uh, tied to a, a horse, and the horse just went forward or went backward, and it moved the box up or down. And and the problem, of course, is not the the box but the rope uh, if it should ever break then whoever's in the box is going to have a, a, a probably an unexpected visit to god so the, the um the real innovation here or invention on part of otis is a braking system that would go out and latch onto the shaft of the elevator and thereby um uh, saving the individuals that are inside of the box and so uh, without the elevator innovation and invention by Otis uh, there wouldn't be skyscrapers 
which was uh, and is still a very big proponent of American business and industry. So in transportation, uh, air brakes, which is something for uh, railroads, becomes a, a very big um, deal here. This is a, a Westinghouse. Trains, therefore, can now become larger, uh, faster. The steam engines can be improved uh, to make even uh, uh, greater speeds and uh, more efficiency in terms of the machine, the uh, engines themselves. And of course, steamboats, which uh, have been around since the 1820s, can also be uh, made to be even more powerful and more effective. And, and this, again, changes a lot about how, how Americans live their lives. Uh, Thomas Edison, of course, when we talk about inventions, you have to talk about Thomas Edison. We believe that he's responsible for well over 1,100 innovations and inventions that changed the consumer world. The light bulb, of course, is the sort of uh, uh, the, 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 the godlike moment where um, uh, man was given fire. The light bulb increases the amount of time that we can produce things. It increases the amount of times that we can be awake and being productive. It increases the amount of time that we can be active and doing things. It lowers the amount of uh, gas that has to be released because of the type of lighting that was before. I mean, thousands and thousands of people died because of gas uh, powered lighting in homes and businesses. And the light bulb is going to clearly revolutionize the way people see their world. In fact, uh, it was during the Gilded Age in the Chicago World's Fair of uh, 1893 that we, we see some of the um, great innovations that come forward. And the entire uh, World's Fair in Chicago was lit with light bulbs. The movie camera is one that people don't really even know Edison had anything to do with, and, and yet the entire film industry is um, uh, indebted to Thomas Edison. The mimeograph, of course, today's copiers significantly uh, more complex and uh, delicate in many ways than in Edison's mimeograph. But then, of course, uh, Edison was also responsible for the phonograph, which is today's recording industry. So uh, Thomas Edison, who started in um, New Jersey of all places, will really uh, become a sort of icon in America. He will be uh, worshipped by many people. He will be seen as so many people's idols. He will be flocked and, and just sort of uh, uh, mobbed everywhere he goes. And he is still, for a lot of people, the sort of quintessential American inventor. And so, um, related to inventions, and somewhat an interchangeable word, in fact, I catch myself uh, interchanging a lot, with invention is innovations. And so, the way to sort of separate that is inventions are things, and innovations are ways to do things. And so um, when we talk about economies of scale, it's the idea that larger entities could amass more capital for investing in means of production. So uh, the best way to think about it is um, if, I am some, if I'm large enough to buy my materials on a scale of, let's say, a Costco, right, then that means I'm getting everything I need to produce things at a lower price. This means I can make my product cheaper and I can provide it at a lower cost, which means that I can dominate a market more. And, and this um, idea of economies of scale really gets its um, main thrust in the Gilded Age. So related to economies of scale is something referred to as mass production and specialization. Now, mass production really gets its start with an innovation uh by um, Eli Whitney. So many of us uh, will know automatically uh, Whitney's name when we uh, connect it to the cotton gin. And so what we forget, however, is that uh, not long after the cotton gin, uh, Whitney uh, went back north to Connecticut where there was a, a, a rather young um, 
arms manufacturing industry in Connecticut, and they were having problems with their production. And uh, Whitney realized that he could uh, mass produce similar products and just interchange them in order to make rifles. And that concept uh, starts this idea of mass production. But it's really in the Gilded Age that it gets um, steam behind it, if you will. And so um, mass production allows you to break down uh, your um, assemblies to various parts in something that started off as what we call a value-added process. And that's where the, the product stayed in the middle of the room and all the different people came up and added value to the product by uh, adding on additional pieces that made the product more valuable. And so what happens is um, uh, in the period after the Civil War, the idea is going to start to come into place about having the product go to the people and have them add on to their pro product uh, to add value to it. And this is going to allow for something called specialization. So rather than trying to learn how to make a shoe, I might be able to be trained to just be able to cut out the leather tongues. And this allows me uh, to make millions and millions of tongues per year, right? Because that's all I do. And I become very specialized at that. And then what happens is... Um, the guy who makes the sole and the person who makes the laces and the person that dyes the leather and all those other things, they can collectively make multiple shoes at a lower price. What this does, however, is it creates a different type of worker, what's referred to as an unskilled laborer. Now, um, it's somewhat deceptive because they are, in fact, doing a skill when they learn the product. It's, it's just that um, it doesn't necessarily require any kind of special training for the person to have the skill. You could, in a sense, uh, fire one person and go out into the street and hire someone else, and they could readily be taught how to make that uh, same uh, product or item. Incorporation is something that gets innovated uh, in this time period, essentially to um, try to get around already existing anti-monopoly laws. Uh, and so what uh, incorporating did was to allow various entities to share or pool monies to maximize investments and uh, using a concept that's very old called limited liability. And that is that uh, instead of everybody sharing all of the burden, it's everybody shares just the proportion of the burden based on their proportion of ownership. And now because America is truly a continental country now and and has to reincorporate the south after the civil war the trains and telegraph machines that are now stretching from coast to coast from north to south needed to have some sort of organization in order for the business day and for travel to be more effective and efficient and and let's face it you don't want trains operating on different time schedules it could be rather lethal and so we get the creation of national time zones. Initially, it was just three time zones, uh, Eastern, Central, and Pacific, but then the, they add mountain time uh, not too long after that. So for infrastructure in this industrial period, uh, we go back to something that had existed for a very, very long time, a canal system. And that's always been the cheapest way to, to ship bulk materials. And in fact, it still is uh, to float uh, bulk materials down uh, uh, any body of water is the cheapest way to, to do it. It's not, however, the fastest. And the railroads take over the canals, really, because um, uh, they were initially used to connect canals, but it ver uh, very quickly became uh, obvious to people that uh, really w what it could do is just uh, carry the product entirely. Uh, the telegraph and telephone networks that get uh, established really followed along railroad lines. Uh, again, it was just sort of the, the most obvious thing to do. You have a straight line where the railroads are, and it's unobstructed. And so um, telegraph and then later telephone lines will simply follow along with them. And then it will be from train stations that lines will t pull out into different urban areas as businesses and then later residences uh, add telegraph and then telephone equipment.
And this, of course, is just going to um, revolutionize communication and the flow of information in the world. Westinghouse and Edison uh, both believed that you could use electricity to uh, power engines and, and uh, obviously light, light bulbs. And uh, the question was, what type, right? Alternate current or direct current? And uh, a fight ensues, and we don't necessarily have to go over it now. It it's, becomes rather comical. I think one of them actually electrocutes an elephant to show the power or the deadliness of, of the other guy's power source or something like that. But anyhow, uh, these, these innovations by, uh, by Westinghouse and Edison are, are really the only way we could take electricity and replace uh, what was then steam power, coal-generated steam which was a, 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 a very noxious uh, gas that uh, got created, and not to mention the soot and all the other negative byproducts of the steam engine system. And perhaps the most important uh, infrastructure change for most of American cities comes in this t time period, and is, uh, the idea of uh, modern sewerage and, and waste management. It was always very... Um, for lack of a better word, disgusting to travel in a lot of American cities, particularly in the more uh, poorer areas of a city, uh, because um, people were still using outhouses and, and um, garbage was literally strewn into the streets and people would allow wild pigs and chickens to uh, forage through them. And so you can just imagine the sort of uh, putridness, if you will, of the, uh, of the smell of some of these areas. So integration and incorporation really become important for American uh, industry. And that's because it allowed for a more efficient use of investment dollars. So now um, some of our big in industrial giants come out of this period and, and they'll innovate in, in these areas. So when it comes to integration, Andrew Carnegie is seen as sort of the grand champion of vertical integration. So if you think about vertical, it's up and down. And so vertical integration means that uh, an individual can own all the levels of producing their product. So in the case of, of Carnegie Steel, he actually owned his own uh, coke and iron ore mines and facilities. He owned the rail cars that transported all of those materials to his um, uh, uh, steel mills. He, of course, owned the steel mills. He owned the retail and the wholesale side of that uh, product. He controlled every aspect of it. His goal, he once said, was to ensure that not one penny of profit went to anyone but himself. Now... What this did, of course, is it allowed Carnegie to cut costs whenever he needed to. So if he thought that he needed to um, get his pricing down, he could go ahead and change uh, the costs for his products because, of course, he owned it all. So he could uh, do that. And this allowed him to undersell competitors. And this allowed him then to um, dominate the steel market. Horizontal integration has always existed, but the, the, the sort of grandfather of this is John D. Rockefeller and oil. Uh, horizontal integra integration is when you own most of the providers of a certain product and or service. So Ro Rockefeller actually owned all of the factors of his production as well. But what he did is um, he owned all of, he innovated, I should say, a way of transporting oil using uh, specialized railroad cars and he produced these railroad cars and then he allowed railroad companies to use his cars to transport oil but to do that they had to give him special rates for transporting his oil and then charge the market prices and in fact over market prices for his competitors so it uh, after a while uh, Rockefeller could simply wait for his um uh, refinery competitors to simply get priced out of business and then he would buy up their their production facilities. 
And this allowed him to dominate most of the market. And in fact, he at one point is going to have well over 95% of the oil market in the United States and, and even bigger shares in other parts of the world. Efficiency is something uh, that is often referred to as Taylorism. Uh, that's uh, named after the innovator uh, Taylor, who came up with this "quote unquote" concept. Uh, Taylor would get hired to uh, essentially review the working process of mass production and the breaking down of tasks into their specialized categories, and so he did these. Uh, numerous and meticulous studies of observing these unskilled workers and how much time it took them to produce a piece of the product. And so this uh, allowed him to essentially say that the average worker should be able to produce this many pieces per hour in an eight hour workday. And this allowed employers to set a, a work standard for all of their, their employees. So just as a hypothetical, you might say that um, uh, Taylor's study said that an average worker could produce, say, uh, 20 widgets per hour. And so in, in, in an eight-hour day, that's 160 widgets. So the employer at the widget factory could tell their workers, okay, um, you have to produce 160 uh, uh, widgets today. And if you can't uh, do that, then you know, you're going to be let go. And then you could also say to workers, anybody who makes more than 160 widgets a day will get an additional price per widget. And this um, allowed employers to incentivize workers, but it also allowed them to standardize uh, the work, uh, the workplace. Now, the, the, the problem with Taylor's studies, and they were quickly criticized, although they really maintained a, a role, and, and still efficiency studies are still a big part of, of industry. Uh, but T Taylor never took into account the fact that when people thought they were being watched or were working while being watched, they produced much more. And so um, they, they would, uh, you know, sort of up their game because they knew they were being watched. And so if I did that and came up with this figure of 160 widgets, it was, it was really an unrealistic goal because no worker could sustain that level of production over an indefinite period of time. And so um, many people are going to renounce uh, Taylor for his work. Certainly... Um, uh, the emergence of labor unions in the time period are definitely going to uh, reject Taylor's uh, quote-unquote science uh, because they, they felt that it was um, detrimental to, to their workers. The mail order business is something that really ignites a different type of consumerism in the United States. Americans used to be, if you can believe this, a nation of savers. Uh, Americans used to uh, squirrel away uh, a large portion of their income. And, and it had a lot to do, of course, with the fact that most Americans were agricultural workers, which meant they were, they were really only paid once a year. And so it became really important uh, to be able to um, save money and set it aside and make sure that you, know, you were um, uh, keeping something around. Mail order business, however, really gets its innovation with uh, with the Sears catalog. And there have been other mail order businesses like the Shakers, for, an uh, for instance, um, you know, a, a Christian sect from the 1830s and 40s. They, they started a mail order business uh, selling seeds for gardeners. Uh, but it's, uh, it's really Sears and Roebuck uh, that really demonstrated the mail order business, followed by J.C. Penney and, and Montgomery Ward. And they, uh, based in Chicago, which was the railroad hub of the entire country, um, they uh, built enormous warehouses, which you can still see there in Chicago if you get a chance to go. And uh, they would just have an emor enormous storehouse of products there. And then their catalog was sent to people all over the country, in fact, the world. And, and people could simply mail in orders with uh, a, a check or some people did cash which I don't understand how they would do that but anyway um, and their orders would be filled and, and, and sent back to them 
and it becomes really a part of American life. And what's really interesting that people uh, don't necessarily re- uh, understand is that this is really the first time we can talk about national style trends. Because the Sears catalog could send you a picture, it was a drawing of course, but this is what a living room looks like and you have a house, a, a couch and a chair and a, and a coffee table, and, right? And, and so um, uh, this was really the first time. Prior to this, it, 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 when you talked about styles and trends and modes, particularly when it came to interior decorating and houses, you really tended to see regional tastes and now we're going to see it more on a national scale. The trusts, what many of us now uh, call trusts, were actually monopolies. A trust was a legal vehicle that had existed for a very long time. And, and they were done by uh, wealthier people to, to help them avoid taxes, but also to avoid scrutiny, public scrutiny. And so um, an individual or a couple or even a company uh, could set aside a trust fund and it would uh, acquire assets generate profits through investments usually of some kind and then uh, the 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 um, the fund itself would have designated what we call trustees or people for whom the trust was going to pay a, a dividend and for many people this was uh, what they did for their children and grandchildren and so um, uh, you may have heard of an individual uh, who seems to be very wealthy and, and, and yet doesn't work, and somebody might say to you, oh, well, he's a trust baby, or she's a trust baby. And that's because uh, their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents had set aside large amounts of money in a trust fund, and uh, those monies have been left for posterity, and, and now these individuals get to uh, get a check cut basically every year from the fund. Um, again, John D. Rockefeller is an innovator here, and he used the, the already existing legal vehicle of a trust in order to avoid monopoly laws. And so uh, what he did is he owned a number of assets all under separate entities, but all paying into the same trust, which was called the Standard Oil Trust. And this allowed for uh, Rockefeller to avoid uh, monopoly laws because he could say, oh no, that's company A and company B and company C. See, they have all different names on them. But in, in point of fact, uh, all of those three companies were under the same trust. And this uh, will later be attacked uh, by the Congress in something called the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890. So uh, immigration has... Uh, another thing that uh, really is big in the Gilded Age, we've always had immigrants. There's been waves of immigration all through American history, as I said it before. However, this is the beginning of what we call the Great Migration. And between 18, uh, basically 1865, up until 1920, something like 38 million new people come to the United States. It's, just, it's really, really large. And if you think about it, that's the entire population of California uh, being added to the country. And so it's, it's quite a bit. And so we get these terminologies used. And so um, when we talk about traditional immigration, right, these are, these are immigrants who have always been coming since uh, Europeans landed in the New World. Uh, back in 1492, and that is uh, immigrants from Northern and Western Europe. And uh, so for us in the United States, this was predominantly Spanish in, in, in the South, West, uh, English in the East, uh, French in the North, right? And uh, in the early goings in American history, we had mostly German and Irish immigrants coming into the United States as well as Scottish Irish and, uh, excuse me, uh, Scots-Irish and uh, Scandinavians. And those people will continue to come to the United States. But what makes this immigration wave unique is that it was the beginning of a non-traditional immigration group. These were Southern and Eastern Europeans and also uh, individuals from Asia. And when we talk about Southern and Eastern Europe, we're talking about mostly 
uh, people coming to the Northeast and, and feeding American factories and, and, and the Midwest. So um, Asian immigration was mostly in the West Coast and predominantly started in the 1850s to try to take advantage of the gold rush. And so with this huge influx of immigrants, we see a reemergence of something called nativism. So if you have not used that term before, nativism is simply the belief that the, that the, that the bulk of the benefits of citizenship should be reserved to those individuals who are native born. This was particularly true about housing and jobs. So um, in the late 19th century, nativism rears its ugly head again, and it comes in various forms. Uh, the, the obvious, of course, is the, uh, the, the desire to, to just not want certain people in your neighborhood. And so uh, the idea of segregating people by race had been around for a very long time in America, but now we're going to see it by ethnicity. And it's a, it's a bizarre phenomena in a country that is prides itself on integrating various cultures and, and principles. But this is really uh, quite unique to the United States, but or I should say qu quite unique to this time period in American history in the sense that um, it's going to be done on such a large scale. In fact, the government eventually become involved. So in the 1880s, we're going to get our first attempt by the national government to quote-unquote regulate immigration. And this stems a lot, not just from the volume, but the fear of the unknown. These Catholics and Jews and Armenians who are coming into the country, uh, Asians coming into the West Coast, uh, were just too foreign and different for the bulk of American people. And, uh, you know, the usual rumors and fears of uh, plagues and diseases and criminal um, infiltration uh, caused a lot of trepidation. And the Congress of the United States is going to make a very uh, decisive effort to regulate that process. And, of course, we know that as Ellis Island and the West Coast Angel Island. And this is going to be a system set up in order to regulate who comes into the United States, for what purpose, and where will they go in the United States? So prior to this, you know, people were essentially just dropped off wherever the boat landed, and the person then had to figure out a way to integrate themselves. And then they had to prove that they've been around long enough, they go through a different process and th that we refer to as naturalization in order to become a citizen of the United States. This was no longer acceptable because people were just staying in the large cities along the coast and it was causing all kinds of problems. I mean, genuine problems. And so Ellis Island uh, not just uh, was there to uh, filter people out who might be, have criminal records or have highly communicable diseases, but they were also there to provide transportation services. There was actually a uh, rail and steamboat uh, companies there on site. Uh, to give people um, transportation to the interior of the country. And there were also work agents there, people who would show up to um, hire workers to go into into places like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Chicago uh, to work in the nation's factories. So um, the multicultural influences that come out of this, however, is really going to feed the innovation in this in this country because they're coming from so many different backgrounds. And, and even more importantly, the, the mindset of an immigrant is so different from uh, those who are already in place. The eagerness, the drive to succeed, the, 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 the need, if you will, to make things better uh, creates a, a great deal of uh, innovation uh, that, helps, that helps the country. And then, of course, at its base level here, this was cheap labor. And it was, and it, and this was something industry took advantage of. There's no question about it. Um, they, they, this cheap labor was very hard to unionize because you had so many different languages. Uh, if you can imagine trying to get people who were from Poland and Italy and Armenia and you know, and uh, you know, uh, Ireland and you know all these other places and try to get them all to understand the same concept in terms of work rates and pay scales and you know workers rights and different types of issues really becomes nearly impossible
And because new people were constantly coming in, wages could be kept uh, inordinately low. And so to be at the very bottom of the pay scale, if you will, in America at this time period, is, is it's really, really depressing. So when we talk about our captains of industries, this is a term that came up because of a, of a sort of a rags to riches uh, motto that gets attached to the industrialization of the Gilded Age. And so um, many people um, who are going to sort of um, read the books of a guy named Horatio Elgar and this this idea that if you work hard and play by the rules, you could become just unbelievably wealthy. And um, this plays out for a large segment of the population, what we today call the American dream. Uh, but other people are going to see it very differently and decide that, you know, these people aren't really captains of industry, but actually robber barons. So these large corporations provided things that Americans really benefited from jobs, cheaper products, new consumer products that, you know, convenience for living like light bulbs and and uh, cheaper food and, uh, you know, clocks and gizmos and all sorts of products for the home, like electric generated um, uh, washing machines and vacuum cleaners and an electric toaster. I mean, all these things are just going to be seen as just such wonders for people. And it, it did provide some of the answers to some of the big problems that Americans were facing. But large, but these large corporations, these, these captains of industry, also abused workers. They created unhealthy and unsafe work environments. It was just, uh, it was, some of these places were lethal. And um, we, we forget that a number of industrial workers died every day, uh, making America the largest industrial uh, country. And so uh, these workers would also be paid the lowest possible wage. There was no minimum wage back then. There was also no income tax, but there was no minimum wage. And so the disparity between haves and have-nots quickly becomes very, uh, very wide, not a gap, a chasm. And then, of course, um, there were no pollution standards. And so these companies were just taking their untreated waste and dumping it into the nation's rivers and streams lakes and oceans and it you know it it doesn't take much of an imagination to to realize what's going to happen um it does start the growth of a genuine middle class however these are the managers these are the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants these are a lot of the people who are able to find a niche for themselves in this new industrial era and it gives them a great deal amount of uh, security in the United States. So politicians struggle to understand or accept their role in business because um, for for a very long time, Americans uh, tended to embrace laissez-faire economics, the concept that came from Adam Smith, of course, or liberal economics, the idea that government should keep its hands off of the economy and allow things to just go uh sort of unregulated and what happens in that environment of course which is just sort of the ceteris paribus reality is that there's going to be boom and bust periods well the problem of course is during the bust periods a lot of people suffer and and starting in the gilded age there's there begins a conversation both inside and outside of government about what role should the government play during these business cycles now, Andrew Carnegie, who really is a rags to riches story, he immigrates to the United States, absolutely flat broke boy from Scotland, and emerges to become uh, probably the second, if not the, well, the third, if not the second, most wealthy man of American history. And so um, he writes a book called The Gospel of Wealth. And in it, he essentially coins the idea of a Protestant work ethic. And this is the notion of um, you go to work, you put an honest day work for an honest day's pay. Your boss says jump, you say how high. He asks you to put in four hours, you put in five. You know, this. these are the things that you just do. And that um, God blesses those who 
bless themselves. That, that if you go out there and work hard, God's going to reward you with things. Hence, gospel of wealth. And so, um, Andrew Carney, as many of you may know, became an incredible philanthropist. He gives away something like 90% of his wealth before he dies. And, and he was, um, very mindful of that. Something that the Europeans called the noblesse oblige or the, the, uh, obligations of the noble class. Um, Carnegie believed that if, if, you know, that if God blesses you with unbelievable amounts of wealth, he expects you to do good things with it and to do it for the good of as many of, as much of a humanity as you possibly can. It's just what you had to do. Carnegie was convinced of that. And so um, some, uh, it, it stemmed from a, a, a quote from the book of Romans, unto whom much is given, much shall be required. And, and he lived by that. He really believed in it. But he also was somewhat of a, a judgmental person, very Scottish, you know, uh, if you will, a um, true Presbyterian from the period, right? He in, in, engaged society for the good of mankind, but um, Andrew Carnegie would not give a dime to a man begging on the streets. In fact, he, if he did anything, he would chastise the man for, for sitting around doing nothing, um, but he provided millions for um, hospitals and libraries and uh, universities and and uh, other types of beautification products projects all over the country, he he was very very committed to it. In fact, he and John D. Rockefeller get into somewhat of a competition over who could give the most money away, and it it it, it re reemerges in American history. Most recently, it was uh, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett who started a club of uh, you know bajillionaires who are out there trying to figure out great ways that they can take their money and, and give it away for good causes before they die. So one of the things that happens with industry is it changes both the status and the agency of women. Uh, there's a tendency sometimes to talk about women in the workplace and to focus on uh, the negative. And, and it's important to do that because if you don't, if you don't talk about the problem, you can't fix it. But it's good for our purposes here in a historical analysis to look at the amount of change that exists. So um, not to necessarily say worse or better, but to say different or more. And so um, in the sense of the industrialization of the United States, in particular that concept of specialization, allowed for women to etch out, if you will, certain sectors of the economy that they as a gender will dominate so um secretarial skills the 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 uh, invention of the typewriter uh was a f phenomenal thing but when you looked at the original typewriters which were very tiny but it, cumbersome things um they were really almost built for a woman's fingers which is a horrible stereotype if you will but what happened, however, is that women began to dominate this industry, and they'll dominate it for decades, really almost a century of female domination in the secretarial uh, parts of, of American industry, and um, in education as well. And this is something that started really in the early 19th century. What had, what had happened for a long time in American history is that schools were often led by uh, young men who had just graduated from American colleges and universities, which was typically around the age of 19. And so uh, while they were sort of, quote-unquote, finding themselves, uh, they would go and teach. And so what happened, however, is that uh, more and more men were drawn to other professions, and women started to take over these jobs, particularly at the elementary level, and uh, this notion of the, what they call the school marm, uh, a single uh, young woman uh, teaching all the grades in one room, if you will. I mean, this sort of stereotype existed. And, and then when she married, the expectation was that she was going to leave the job. This was true in all fields. And then uh, once uh, all the children were, in a sense, uh, married off and had families of their own and gone, this sort of empty nester, uh, oftentimes the older women uh, would would go back into the classrooms. Well, starting in the Gilded Age, women are going to dominate. They're absolutely going to dominate uh, K through 12 education. 
and again, particularly K through six, uh, but in uh, all levels, women are going to be the dominant workforce. And then really, uh, Claire Barton's work in the Civil War and the call to women to, to help in this way um, started this trend where women would dominate in this particular part of medicine. And the, all the same rules are applying, right? She gets the job, she gets the training, she does all these different things, and then she could be successful, she could be not so successful, she could be happy or not so happy. But regardless of that, when she got married, she left, she did other, you know, she did the, the wife and mother thing and, and kind of, you know, came back to it after uh, the children were all gone. And this becomes a dominant thing in American society, culturally and socially, for a very long time. Uh, and so the way we want to look at this here is, did these jobs, did these careers give women equal status and agency? And the answer is clearly no. You cannot ever make that argument here. However, what you want to be able to do is to say, but by dominating entire segments of the workforce, women got more agency and more status in their lives because of this reality it, it it it's it's not um making moral judgment it's not making quantitative judgment it's or qualitative judgment it's it's making a it's making an observation about what was really happening so telephone operators is another example of this because uh again the circuit boards at the time were if you kind of think of your headphones jack that goes into your cell phone um this is the way phone calls were connected back then. It, attacked, it took an actual human being to take a call from someone and connect it to another person. It's really ridiculous. And you can actually see old uh, videos of uh, telephone operation rooms. It was, took entire buildings of, secretar- or, excuse me, of uh, operators. And so um, it's so hard for us to believe this t- in today's reality. But you, know, you could pick up a phone and there would be a, a person uh, there to answer and you would literally tell them who you wanted to call um, in fact there's an old um, uh, swing dance song by a guy named Glenn Miller in the big band era and he actually made a song about his girlfriend's phone number Pennsylvania 65000 and um, and that because that was what he would say when he picked up the phone this operator would say who are you calling and he would say Pennsylvania 65000 and that was his girlfriend's phone number so the the thing that becomes ever more prevalent and remains so in many ways is this idea of cult of domesticity and it's it's articulated in various forms but the ideal that a woman controlled the home and that they were best suited for being housewives and mothers. Uh, this idea is, is obviously very old in human history. Um, in American history, it gets articulated by somebody named Catherine Beecher, Harry Beecher Stowe's sister, uh, back in the early 1800s, this idea that, that, that women were just as smart as men, but that they had a quote-unquote sphere of influence over the home, the hearth at home, as, as she put it. Uh, and so... Um, it had a certain amount of status in society, but it had limited status and limited agency. And so um, for women in the Gilded Age, they're going to start to fight to increase that status and agency, and their focus is going to be primarily to end child labor. Um, and, and it's a child labor is a very interesting concept because um, some people argue that it's a a first world issue, meaning that when people are wealthy, they can afford to not have their kids work. And that really seems to be the case when you look at the statistics in the Gilded Age and the latter Gilded Age and then into the early uh, 20th century. And that's the idea that um, as societies became wealthier, um, families uh, had the sort of income to defer work for their kids to allow them to be uh, more highly trained or uh, educated in order to improve their lives and it became sort of a goal but a lot of women in the United States are going to join together and form societies to improve this um, the working conditions for all people but more importantly to try to 
uh, pass laws to make it uh, illegal for, for children to miss school in order to do work. And the woman who sort of rises above this, uh, or I should say rises to lead all of this, is Jane Addams. And she gets her start in the latter Gilded Age, and she's, she's most famous for what she did for immigrant and poor people. But she also went out and clamored very loudly for the, uh, the greater status for women, particularly when it came to legal standing on domestic issues. Uh, but um, uh, she also advocated for the poor and immigrant. Um, so, uh, it's with the rise of industry, of course, comes the rise of labor unions. And um, the most radical of these were the Molly Maguires, and these are Irish immigrants mostly, uh, who uh, never uh, feared using violence in order to settle scores or avenge labor abuses. Um, managers and factory owners finding their property vandalized, in some cases beaten or killed because of um, perceived abuses in the workplace. Uh, these were individuals that uh, embraced a rather, uh, let's just call it radical labor ideology. Some people believe that the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 is what really set off the modern uh, labor union movement. And um, this was a, a very large strike it shut down the transportation system for the United States for a very long time. Um, Rutherford B. Hayes, President Hayes, uh, gets frustrated with this, and he actually sends federal troops out and uh, to um, break up the strike and to arrest people. And you can imagine the federal government sending the army in to break up a strike. In the West Coast, the Sandlot incident it wasn't just a labor thing, although it started off as a, a dispute about wages and job availability, but it was also about anti-immigrants and uh, the emergence of the Working Men's Party in California that attacked Chinese workers and, and would eventually lead to something called the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. Of, of all the groups that we think about who get discriminated against, still to this day, Chinese Americans, or, or I should say Chinese, are the only nationality or ethnic group that has been barred from immigrating by law and uh, it's just kind of interesting to think about of all the immigrant groups that came into the United States this was the one that got targeted our first actual uh, nationwide labor union is the National Labor Union uh, Wilman's, William Silvis in 1866 and uh, this was basically a drive to just bring awareness all over the country of various abuses. And they are going to clamor for all the things we kind of think of today, right? They wanted an eight-hour workday. They wanted some banking reforms. Uh, they wanted a national, or I should say a federal Department of Labor. And of course, they wanted the uh, labor union activities legalized, uh, and particularly the concept called collective bargaining. And then um, they are replaced uh, pretty quickly by a group called the Knights of Labor. And um, eventually they're going to be led uh, by a guy named Terrence Powderly. And he is going to innovate in areas referred to the sit-down strike and other forms of striking in order to force uh, factory owners to come to the negotiating table. And the Knights of Labor become a, a pretty powerful group uh, starting in 1869. Now, um, what happens, of course, is uh, others uh, become uh, less patient. Mother Jones was an activist, uh, was um, sort of this person who decided that she could use fiery rhetoric and, and excite the crowds and, and get as much media attention as she possibly could. She's um, mostly related with the United Mine Workers Union. And there's still a, a magazine you can get today, Mother Jones Magazine. Uh, that is a legacy of, of her work. Anarchism is something that was all over the Western world at this time period. And, and uh, a number of uh, political leaders, and in particular uh, monarchical uh, leaders, 
are going to be assassinated during this time period. Um, President William McKinley will be uh, shot and killed by an anarchist in 1901. And so anarchism is this belief that all government is repressive and, and, and that uh, violence was, was required um, uh, that violence was okay. You could wipe out people. And the idea was if you got rid of the leadership, people would realize, oh, we don't need them. And so why do we need government? And, you know, this is still very active. Um, there are still anarchist groups in America um, who are uh, pretty vocal people. And this sort of came to light in something referred to as the Haymarket Riot in Chicago in 1886. Um, this was a, a um, demonstration, a parade, simply for uh, labor groups to march in the streets, celebration. And what happened is uh, a pipe bomb went off and killed some people and damaged a significant amount of property. And... Um, Basically, men are arrested and a handful of guys arrested. And, and to be quite honest, I don't know that the that the evidence was very strong. But regardless, uh, these men were self-described anarchists, but they were also card-carrying members of the Knights of Labor. And this created uh, fear in the United States that both anarchism and socialism were infiltrating the United States. And... Um, it destroyed the 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 Knights of Labor. They they're basically they disband. I should say they fall apart. Everybody just kind of uh, leaves, and uh, the Knights of Labor are basically no more. Um, and it's sort of interesting. We get this idea of uh, unions and socialism, and the fact is that um, uh, a great deal of labor union rhetoric comes from Marxist ideology. It's just sort of the way it is. It's it's really more of a Marxist worldview. And that gets confusing for people because when you say Marxist, people think of communist Russia. And it's there's it's not that kind of a connection necessarily, right? So all communists are Marxists, but not all Marxists are communists, if you will. And and yet a lot of the leadership in American labor movements did subscribe to a Marxist worldview. And so uh, this sort of familiarity uh, bred contempt, if you will, um, among the American people. And it becomes a stigma that sort of attaches to labor movements even, even today. So when the Knights of Labor are destroyed, uh, they are replaced by the American Federation of Labor, often referred to the AF of L. And this is Samuel Gompers. He was president of what was called the Cigar Makers Union, or the, some people called it the Intellectuals Union. And that's because um, while uh, rolling cigars can seem somewhat of a tedious thing, uh, you actually had to uh, pay attention to it. But it was a rather boring process. And so um, in many of the shops where cigars were made, uh, they would rotate and one of the... Uh, one of the scar makers or sometimes they would just have a, a young boy come in and they would read they would read books out loud they would read the newspaper they would spark discussions and conversations and so um, this this group um, was r really very well read and argued if you will and so uh, Gomper starts the AFL in 1886 and it quickly takes over and still is America's largest labor union and uh, for um, the AFL is, is what we refer to as an umbrella organization. So it's, it's really a collection of various smaller unions. And in the cases of, of the AF of L, uh, the focus was mostly on skilled workers. So, you know, the, the, the uh, cigar makers is, is the example. And so Gompers only wanted skilled workers to be unionized. He believed that unionizing unskilled workers would bring down the wages of everybody. And so the uh, founding members of the AFL were all skilled labor unions, the Teamsters, the Seamstresses, the Stevedores, or the, the people who actually, um, uh, uh, you know, dock workers at uh, port facilities. These are all different types of people who formed into these unions. And the, the, the beauty of this is that um, if any one group was on strike, 
the other group could collect monies to sustain them while they weren't working, or they could go on what was called a sympathy strike and create even more public attention uh, to the woes of another group. So uh, the AFL is going to peak at membership of 4 million in 1920, and uh, they are going to play a prominent role in the Homestead Steel Strike in 1892. And this particular thing, Homestead, Homestead Steel Strike is in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, uh, area outside of it called Homestead, Pennsylvania. And this was the location of Andrew Carnegie's uh, main steel mill. And uh, Carnegie was the first industrialist to recognize the unions. He was seen as very pro-union. Uh, but he had put in charge of his factory. His day-to-day -day operations were handled by a guy named Henry K. Clay Frick. And I always joke to people that he was he was pretty much of a he was a, pretty much of a Frick. Um, but anyhow, uh, Frick did not share Carnegie's appreciation for the working man. Uh, he was uh, very um, condescending to workers. He was very suspicious of labor leadership. He embraced this whole idea that they were basically communists and socialists and anarchists. And so when Carnegie went away uh, to Scotland for the summer, which he did almost every year, he, he bought a castle for cash, <laughs> if you will, um, uh, Frick took advantage of this and really poured on some uh, arduous tasks onto the workforce. In fact, uh, one worker suffers a heart attack on the job and dies simply because of heat exhaustion and, and exposure to too much uh, hard labor. And when the union complained about it, he fired people. And so uh, they decided to go on strike. Um, what happened, however, is that Frick uh, called in security uh, detail. I believe, I believe they were the Pinkertons. Uh, they came in and gunfire breaks out and, and people are killed. And uh, the government has to send in troops to uh, break up this strike. And it mars Carnegie's reputation uh, among the labor unions. And um, in fact, during this strike, uh, a, a, a union activist uh, sneaks into the office building and stabs him in the neck. And um, uh, Frick still had his wherewithal to just beat the crap out of the guy and have him arrested. I mean, it's pretty remarkable stuff. Um, this is followed in 1894 by the Pullman strike. Pullman, again, was another guy who was initially seen as an innovator. He invented a railroad car, the Pullman car. And instead of just uh, establishing a factory in some already um, known entity, he created his own space, what we today call factory towns. And he built a factory, he built a school, he built a health clinic, he built a general store and all these other things, and he built housing for his workers. And so he sort of touted it as a worker's paradise. And in many ways it was. Uh, when you got hired, you got a working badge that had your number on it. You wore it as a necklace or held it in your wallet. You reported to work every day, punched in. And uh, then um, your payday would literally be at a window that you went up to. And you were given a pay slip that would tell you what your gross pay was and how much money was being deducted for the various things you did, like your rent and schools and you know doctor visits. You could literally go into the store and simply show your worker's badge, and they would just send the cost of your groceries to the to the payroll office, and they would just simply deduct it from your pay. And it was you know kind of a almost utopian type of reality. What happens is there's a, a major um, panic in 1893. In fact, it's called the Great Panic, uh, and and uh, the Pullman industry, just like all industries, goes into a downward uh, trend, a, a bust period. And Pullman decides not to fire anybody, not to, not to lay off anyone. But instead, he cuts everybody's salary, everybody's salary, uh, by I think it was like something like 30%. Which again sounds really magnanimous, except he didn't reduce his rents by, six, by the same amount nor did he reduce the prices of all the different goods and services that were available for sale. And so uh, people's lives obviously became pretty miserable. And so they went on strike. Uh, 
And this was important because um, a sympathy strike was called by the American Railroad Workers Union and its president, Eugene V. Debs, becomes a major activist in this, in this situation. And now we're talking about President Grover Cleveland. And what happened was Debs called on all railroad workers to refuse to service any train that had a Pullman car on it. Well, that was virtually every train in America. And so um, everything stopped. So the delivery of food and coal, coal was what most Americans used to heat their homes. And, um, and a lot of companies still used it to generate power for their factories. This is big. This is a major, major, major setback. And so um, uh, President Cleveland ordered uh, the unions to stop the strike, in particular the, the Railroad Workers Union. And um, Debs refused, claiming that he had a free speech right. And, uh, and, and so what happens is Debs is arrested and thrown in prison. Uh, the, the, the government arrests him, the army. And there's a Supreme Court in Ray Debs in which the court was asked, was it okay for them to do it? And, and, and essentially the court agrees. Um, uh, Cleveland said that not one postcard would fail to be delivered to Chicago. And, and that was because uh, the entire mail service operated on railroads. And, and it actually is a crime to stop the delivery of the mail. So um, as odd as that may sound, and so uh, Deb stayed in prison, and it's while he's in prison that he gets his hand on uh, Marxist literature, and he leaves prison a devoted socialist, and he'll actually run for president one time from jail, actually. Uh, and so, as I had said before, there's unbelievably powerful things here. America becomes the world's leading industrial power by 1900 and that's just a phenomenal idea when you just sort of let that soak through and, and sort through in your brain but it 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 caused a number of questions to still emerge right how much freedom should be afforded to private enterprise i mean if you think about it they're using the earth's resources they're using workers who obviously they don't own, right? We're not slaves to our job, although many of us may feel that way, right? But but at the same time, it was Pullman's innovation that created the work. It was Pullman's money that invested into the town and the factory and the jobs and all this other stuff. So this, this balancing act uh, has to get figured out somehow. And uh, this becomes a big problem for American industry and for society as a whole. And then what is the role of the federal government in regulating interstate commerce? So if you look at Article 1, Section 8, the only area of industry that, that, government, that the federal government is supposed to have is a control over interstate commerce. And yet you have to ask yourself, in an era of industrialization, where everybody is integrated coast to coast, north to south, and railroads and telegraphs and telephones interconnect us all, is any commerce not interstate and this becomes a very big question in and outside of the courts and it really doesn't get settled settled until the 1930s and there's still a lot of people who have problems with that resolution so how many rights does the labor uh, union have or laborers in general in a free market system right uh, if i go and work for abc factory um what rights do I retain even though I'm technically going on to someone else's property and I am voluntarily choosing to uh, commit my time to uh, a particular set of labor? Uh, do I retain any kind of rights at all? And then are there collective remedies to the negative social byproducts of this rapid industrialization? Is, you know, what are there remedies to the pollution that's created to the to the unsanitary environments is there a way to improve safety collectively what do we do about uh earning potential and the ability of of uh working people to pay for the essentials of life whatever that may be defined as and then what constitutes good economic growth? It's a term that gets thrown around quite a bit if you think about it, right? When people talk about sustainable de development today, or they talk about you know good growth, uh, 
what what exactly does that mean? And could it mean different things to different people or different groups or different communities? I mean, there's if you look at it, for instance, today, um, there are a lot of towns in in West Virginia and Southwest uh, Pennsylvania and Southeast Ohio and and Eastern Tennessee and Kentucky who still believe that the coal industry is perfectly fine. They'll, they, they live in the soot and they don't care. Um, they, they made good money doing that and they, they, they want to do that. And, and if you remember, Donald Trump made a big deal out of that, right? But, you know, I'm going to revive the coal industry, right? And so you have to ask, well, what constitutes good growth? And is it possible for any one set of people to determine what that is and uh, to make that the right choice?